Amen. Amen. Um, you know, there's a moment Jesus is fasting in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights. You guys remember that? Can you imagine going 40 days without food? No, you can't, right? None of us can. Like we would just die, right? He does. And Satan comes and says, I can turn these stones into bread for you. Do you remember that? And what does Jesus say to him? He said, I don't need your food. I need the word of God. That's what he says. Like if God would just speak to me, I need God's word more than I need food or drink or anything in this life. Hey, did you come hungry to church this morning? Because you need to be hungry for God's word. Who's hungry? Are you hungry this morning? We need to be hungry for God's word, ready to receive. So I've got a picture for you on the screens right now. Some maniac is on top of a telephone pole. That's me two years ago. I don't know how high that thing was. Maybe it's 20 feet, maybe it's 25 feet. But my daughter and I were at a ropes course. And, you know, somebody ought to climb that thing, you know, and, and, and jump off of it. And that was the whole goal of this particular um, uh, challenge in the ropes course. And, and so I remember climbing up this, this telephone pole. And, you know, you're in a climbing harness and there's ropes and there's safety and all this kind of stuff. And I'm climbing up this thing and nobody's helping you, right? It's just... And you get to the top, and the hardest bit was all there is is that circle up top. And you've got to somehow climb on top of this thing and stand up with no safety handles, no nothing. you just got to get yourself to a standing position. And how many of you know that that telephone pole started to wobble? <laughs> right? <laughs> it did. And... And, and, and you're standing up there and everybody's cheering for you and trying to encourage you below and they want you to jump. And did we have the zoomed in version of that? Now something's striking you right away, right? Some of you are like, those orange socks, that was a good fashion choice, right? <laughs> like, and you're right, you're totally right. But the other thing that should strike you about that picture is it, this was no lean, okay? This was no like lean over and grab that bar. This was a leap. You can see the distance. I don't know who took that picture that day, but they were perfectly timed when they did. This is a leap of faith, right? And you're like, well, that's not that big a leap. I mean, come on. Yeah, you go to the top of the telephone pole and you tell me that after because <laughs> it, felt, it felt like a major, major leap. And it worked out well. I'm still alive, amen? I'm still alive. <laughs> But let's break this down because I have a history of overanalyzing things and it works out for me. So let's overanalyze this real quick. Four steps I took in order to make that leap. First off, I started with a reasonable fear, did I not? People don't leap off telephone poles in their right minds. People fall. That's a reasonable fear based on evidence, right? But new facts came in step two that told me that my fear was wrong. New facts came in, i.e., there was a safety harness that had been tested. There were safety ropes. I stood at the, at, at the, on the ground level, and I watched other people make that leap, and they proved to me that it, was, that it was safe. This ropes course that I was at was not under lawsuit that I knew of. <laughs> I had evidence to believe I was going to survive this. So number two, I had facts that said my initial fear was wrong. Number three, I had a moment of fresh fear when the pole started to shake and my legs started to shake. Now it's at number three where everything goes well or doesn't go so well, right? Because when the legs start to shake and the pole starts to shake, then a moment of fresh fear comes in. Now what will I do? That's where the choice really is. And sometimes we get a little bit confused, and it might seem small to you, but it's, it's so, so big. Sometimes we get to step four, we go to make our choice, and we think that faith and trust is about replacing evidence. And it's not about replacing evidence. I had the evidence. The evidence said this was safe. What I had was shaking legs, and that's feelings, and that's fear. See, I wasn't fighting in number four. I wasn't fighting against evidence. I was fighting against fear. And that's what we're going to deal with this morning. 
Don't get yourself confused that I need God to come in and I need him to be the replacement for the evidence. That's not what he's asking you to do. He's asking you to not be driven by your feelings and fears through this life because you'll have no stability and you'll not operate with trust with him. You'll not take the kind of risks into spiritual growth that he wants you to take. In short, your life will not be an adventure. If you want the adventure, you have to leap off the pole. Amen? Amen. Verse 22 of Matthew 14, here is today's miracle. Because Jesus is Lord over all. Amen? And that's this series. So today's miracle you're about to see here. Verse 22 says, immediately after this. What is this? Well, immediately after this was the feeding of the 5,000 people that Jesus did with just a little bit of bread and a little bit of fish. And he fed all these people, and it was this gigantic miracle, right? And it's recorded in all the Gospels. But John gives us this little detail about the feeding of the 5,000. He says, not only did Jesus feed all these people and everybody got excited, but their excitement went to a fever pitch, and they wanted to make Jesus king by force. Because they had tasted the food, and they were so pumped And they wanted him to not just be Jesus Christ, their savior. They wanted him to be king who would defeat the Roman army. And they went to make him king by force. And Jesus decides to back off. And you'll see the detail here. Immediately after this, Jesus insisted his disciples get back into the boat. So he gets rid of the disciples. And he wants them to cross to the other side of the lake. That's the Sea of Galilee. While he sent the people home. Okay, You 12 guys, I want you to get in a boat. I'm going to deal with this crowd. That's what he's saying. And he's going to dispatch the people. After sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. And night fell while he was there alone. So Jesus goes up to the hills to pray. He sends the disciples across the Sea of Galilee on a boat to to Gennesaret. And Jesus goes up into the hills to pray. Now, there's several times that Jesus gets away alone in the Gospels. If you've read it, you know that he just, he always was spending time with God, with the Father. And this is one of these moments. I just love that he goes up into the hills to pray. You ever go up into the hills to pray? You ever go on a mountaintop? Because it matters. I mean, it's not a command of Scripture that we do that. But there's something about it. Like, if you've not been to the top of Mount Scott with a Bible in your hand, you have missed out. Like, you need to resolve that problem in your life, like, really, really soon. Because it's an amazing experience to be surrounded by the awe and beauty of God's creation. And it just, it does something to us. It just makes us feel closer to him, not surrounded by the lies that we're surrounded with every single day on ground level down here, where the world feels so big. And God feels so far away, does he not? Get on a mountain. Jesus went up on a mountain. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from land. For a strong wind had risen and they were fighting heavy waves. The original text said they were in the middle of the lake. So they're actually several miles from shore here. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them walking on the water. So it does not say three o'clock in the morning in the original text. It says um, at the fourth watch. So in Jewish culture, the fourth watch was officially between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. So between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m., think about it just real quick. The disciples had been fighting the storm all night long. They're exhausted. By the time you get to between 3 and 6 a.m., they're exhausted, amen? Are they afraid? Oh, yeah, they're afraid. And it's still dark. So Jesus has been praying this whole time, and these guys... They're in a spot. You ever go fishing? You ever go in a boat? You ever work against the wind? There's a fishing trip we used to take to Wisconsin every single year. Uh, My dad used to lead that trip, and we would go up there, and we, over the years, got to know this particular area of lakes really, really well in Wisconsin. And you knew where every single low spot was, and, and, and you knew exactly where the best fishing spots were. And I remember we were in this little, little uh, uh, tiny little fishing boat, and a few of us had gone off to the side, and then the wind picked up, and we started to head back to the cabin. It should have taken us about 20 minutes, and instead it took us about two and a half hours. And I'm not exaggerating. It took a long time. 
because basically what we did is we just rode the coast the entire way and the wind just kept blowing us all over. It was hard. It was hard work to get back and you're exhausted and you're afraid and all of that. And that's what the disciples are going through in this moment. And then Jesus comes strolling on the water. Jesus, why didn't you swim? Why you got to stroll on the water? Trying to show it off. I'm Jesus. I walk on the water. Like, what's going on here? First thing we got to understand is human beings can't walk on water. Right? Profound statement in the message this morning. Human beings cannot walk on water. Did you know that? Can we do science for just a minute? Like, it's not possible. Uh, we, we, it doesn't work that way. Why? Because when you take something as dense as a human being and you put it on top of water, H2O, with the level of relative density of H2O, we sink every time. Why? Because we're dense. I'll just let you think about that for a second. Right. Corks and styrofoam, they float, right? It's a different density. There's air being trapped. Sometimes we think it's heaviness. It's not heaviness because an aircraft carrier floats, but a little pebble sinks right down, right? So it's not, it's not weight. It's, 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 it's the relative density between the liquid and the object. And so an aircraft carrier traps air in the, in the decks that are underneath the water that you can't see. And in that trapped air, that changes the density level. And so relatively, a bit of it sinks, a bit of it stays out of the water. And that's the way that that works. But a human being doesn't float. We drop right down. Every time. Right? Every time. Human beings sink. Unless you're a basilisk lizard. You got a picture. You're like, wait a second, Pastor. I've seen National Geographic, and I know about the basilisk lizard. I'm ready for you today. <laughs> How does this work then? Well, the basilisk lizard, relative to its size, it can move so fast across the water, and its feet are especially built to slap the water, that it can actually move across the water at a high speed run relative to its size and it stays above the surface and that works so they did a study and they said in order for a human being to mimic that what would have to happen we would have to run about 67 miles per hour across the water at our size about as fast as a cheetah the fastest human being that I know of is Usain Bolt, who ran 23 and a half miles per hour at the 2019 World Championships. Not even close, right? And even if you could find a human being who could run that fast, those same scientists tell us that you would have to, in that run, expand, expend about 15 times more energy than a human being is capable of producing. In short... You are dense. <laughs> and then we've got pontoon shoes guy. Do we have that one? There he is. So you got a guy who crossed part of the Atlantic and basically stri strapped boats to the bottom of his feet. That is officially cheating. Because <laughs> if you're on two little boats, it's not you that's floating, it's the boats. So what's Jesus doing here? Job chapter 9 Verse 7, and I believe the disciples knew this before the miracle. Job chapter 9, verse 7 is describing God, and this is what he says. He says, if God commands it, the sun won't rise and the stars won't shine. He alone has spread out the heavens, and he marches on the waves of the sea. He does not run at 60 miles per hour. He marches. He walks. He doesn't swim. He's above it. Do you see God showing off? Do you see his power here? And Jesus is making a very, very careful statement to these 12 disciples. I am God, is what he's saying. He's showing them a miracle that proves the point. Verse 26, when the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. Wouldn't you be in the middle of the night, exhausted? It's not like you've seen other people walk on water before. This is pretty scary. In their fear, they cried out, it's a ghost. 
Now, when they say it's a ghost, what are they doing? Again, they've got no frame of reference for this. They have no idea why in the world a human being, even though they can't see the person's face, would be walking toward them. They assume, they, they, they don't even go to, to their physical experience, they go to a legend, right? Legends of ghosts. And they start thinking about like what hovers above the ground. Maybe a ghost does. and They don't know. They don't know what they're talking about. But Jesus spoke to them at once and said, don't be afraid. He said, take courage, I am here. Take courage, I am here. Now that phrase there, I am here, that's not the way that it's written in the original text. And that's, this one's really, really important. Sometimes they're just fun little details. This one's massive. So what Jesus actually says there is he declares the divine name and says, I am. And he actually says it twice. He says, I am, I am. And the two Greek words there are ego, which means I am. It's, the, it's that personal pronoun, I and then E-I, me, I'm going to try and pronounce that. I'm probably doing it wrong. E-I, me is the second word. It means the same thing. I am. So Jesus basically responds to them in the middle of the storm. They're terrified. He says, take courage. I am, I am. Are you stuttering, Jesus? No. It is the emphatic I am is what he's using here. And this particular odd phrasing shows up multiple times in scripture. One of the spots, and this happens a lot in the book of John, one of the spots is in John chapter 8, verse 58, if you're taking notes. John 8, 58. I don't have this one on your screen, but there's a moment where he's talking about Abraham, and he says, before Abraham was, past tense, I am, present tense. Jesus, that's grammatically incorrect, but it's theologically correct. Because God, <laughs> God is past, present, and future all at once. Let that break your brain. Before Abraham was, I am. And the people that were surrounding him got so mad at what they knew he was claiming to be in that moment, they came against Jesus. See, back, back in the Old Testament, there was a moment where Moses, do you remember when Moses went to the burning bush and God was speaking to him out of the burning bush? And the bush was on fire, but it wouldn't burn up. And it was, a, it was a holy moment. And God was present somehow in the bush and talking to Moses. And God tells Moses to go to the Pharaoh and tell the Pharaoh to let my people go. Do you remember this? And he was supposed to set God's people free from the Pharaoh. Uh, all of Israel, they were slaves in Egypt. And Moses has this moment where he's like, how am I going to prove it to the people that I'm actually your messenger? And he has this kind of little crisis moment with God. And he's like, if they ask me, is just some random God sent me here to say this to Pharaoh or the one true God? And God says, you tell them my name is I am. And that's where you see that name, the holy name, the divine name pop up. I am sent you. And that's what Moses went and told the people. The I am sent me. It's Y-H-W-H in the um, Hebrew. We say Yahweh. We, we add our, 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 our little uh, vowels in there just so that we can pronounce the darn thing. But in the original Hebrew, it's just I am, Y-H-W-H. And so Jesus, that's Hebrew, and Jesus comes into the Greek, and he's like, I'm not just going to tell you I'm God like I'm some kind of random God, lowercase g, Okay. Like some people were like, Jesus never claimed to be God. This is where he claims to be God. He does it multiple times throughout the Gospels. He doesn't just say, I'm God or I am a God. He says, I am. And he claims the divine name. And to anybody who understood what the, what the Hebrews understood would have been blown away by that. So Jesus isn't just walking on the water. He's walking on the water and he says, I am, I am. Got to feel the weight of that because it's massive. Verse 28, then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. Yes, come, Jesus said. I love this phrase from Peter. So Peter gets caught up in the moment, gets really excited and says, if it's you, why don't you call me to the water? And it's so weird because you would never say that, right? And I've got no explanation for it. You would, if you said, if it's really you, like that implies I'm not sure. If it's really you, then give me some more proof, is what you would say. Peter says, if it's really you, call me to come, and I'm just going to jump out in the water with you. 
It's odd. I've got no explanation. But that's just what he does. Peter was impulsive sometimes. I also love Jesus' response to him. Okay, you want to come out on the water? Come. Just come. You ever walked on water before? If you had a chance to walk on water, would you want a, I don't know, training session first? Like set of instructions? Like how does one do this? Like walk me through the process. Give me a few tries first. Jesus doesn't do any of that. He just says, come. That is so God. Has God ever done that to you? Like you're in the spot and it's like Abraham. Abraham, I'd like you to leave your home where you've lived all your life. Just leave. And I'm eventually going to show you the land that you're going to go to. Just trust me. Just go. God speaks more often in direction than he does detail. And, and if you're wrestling with that with God, it's part of the faith journey with him. He'll just give you a direction. Okay, next. So Peter went over to the side of the boat, again, not having been through the training, and he walked on the water somehow toward Jesus. So not only, not only did Jesus know he could do it, but Jesus provided the means for him to do it. So the divine power that was in Jesus that is able to walk on water, the God of the universe who designed the laws of nature and density and all of this, like he's making this happen. But when Peter saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and he began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Now, first off, there, it doesn't tell us here how long they walked out there. Now, Peter might have gone out there. They might have had a few minutes together. We don't know. Don't see it just in moments. If the Bible doesn't tell you, it's just in moments. Let your imagination go for a second. They might have had some time. But eventually, the wind fired up again, and Peter starts to freak out. Now, I can't ask yourself, is Peter responding to a lack of evidence? No. See, Peter followed the same steps that I talked about before, right? Like, Peter started in this place where it's like he had a reasonable fear. People don't walk on water. Human beings sink. We're dense. But... I've got new evidence today. I got Jesus Christ and he's walking down the water. So it must be possible for someone who's, who's in league with God. And Peter also knew he had evidence that sometimes Jesus not only did miracles, sometimes he had Peter do miracles along with him up to this point. And he got to use Jesus' power. That was part of their partnership, part of their relationship. And Jesus, or Peter knew Jesus was trustworthy he knew that Jesus loved him, not only had the power, but also loved him and was for him. So Peter's step two had some evidence, amen? He had some evidence. And so that's why he got out of the boat, because he had evidence. But once he was out there, and he had his evidence out there, then the wind started to blow, and his legs started to shake. And he has this moment of fear comes up on him. And he needs faith in that moment, but he doesn't need faith against evidence he needs faith against his feelings and his fears super super important we get so confused on that point god is not trying to ask you to walk with him contrary to evidence he does not want you however to live a life of instability where you're always following your feelings and your fears because you'll never go with him where he wants to go where he wants you to go it's always about trust in a person. Gosh, even, I didn't say this first service, but I'm a, I'm a rabbit trail here for just a second. You okay? Can we do this? Yeah. Marriage. This comes up in premarital classes a lot. Sometimes people get confused when they're making decisions in the midst of their marriage about, well, one of us is more logic and one of us is more emotion. And the emotion person ought to just shut up. <laughs> because we can't make decisions based on emotion. And Linda and I try to walk them through this. I try to let them understand. Logic is not the Lord. It's not. And you get confused about that. What's great about the emotional person in your relationship is they're going to help the other spouse learn that for all their logical arguments, there's a whole lot of emotion in that cocktail as well, whether they're ready to admit it or not. 
You logic people, you're very emotional. (laughs) And you emotion people have got some logic in you too. What is needed is for the logic person and the emotion person to both submit in trust and faith to a Lord, to a Savior together. It's not about logic. It's about trusting God in a person. Woo! All right. I love that Peter took such a big step. I've told this story before, but when Linda and I decided to leave my technology career and go into ministry, and God had called us to go into ministry, we had three kids at home. Gracie was about a year and a half old. Had a lot of bills, okay? I was about to take a monstrous pay cut. We were feeling that. And it was this moment of like, we've got to trust God in this to make all of this stuff make sense for us. I'm not trying to puff us up. I'm just trying to say it was a moment in our lives. And when we actually made the decision, we actually changed jobs. The furnace in our house went out and had to be replaced. There was an ice storm that happened within a week of the furnace And the gutters in our house literally fell off the house because of the ice. We had thousands of dollars of expenses that we incurred suddenly. And she and I are both looking up to heaven like, God? (laughs) Like, don't we get bonus points for doing good stuff for you? Like, I would have thought that I make this decision and now I'm on some, some kind of protection, right? Like, shouldn't it kind of go well? And it was tough, and I remember us talking at the time. We're like, go back to Exodus and the children of Israel. You remember the very first time that Moses goes before Pharaoh and says, let my people go. And he's walking out in obedience to God. He's doing the right thing. Do you remember what Pharaoh does? Pharaoh says, oh, yeah? How about we'll do bricks without straw. You gather your own straw when you go to make your bricks and I'm going to keep your quotas the same for every single day. So I'm going to take the labor of you slaves and make it way, way harder on you. So they walked faithfully in obedience to God and the enemy of our souls just went after them. And God led it. And we don't talk about this kind of stuff nearly enough. But when you obey God big like Peter... Do you expect that, man, if I set foot in the water, I did something for Jesus, darn it. Maybe maybe the wind and the waves, maybe they ought to chill out for me. Because you're about to see Jesus is about to settle the storm. He's about to calm the storm. But he doesn't do it for Peter. He waits until the end when they get back in the boat together, and then he calms the storm. And you're like, Jesus, why? Some of you guys were here last week. And we talked about timing and how Jesus chose a timing for Mary and Martha in the Lazarus situation. And he didn't go right away. He went in a way that would stretch their faith. Because he's always, always trying to grow us up. And yeah, he could have calmed the storm as soon as Peter got in the water. But he didn't. Because God does not ever owe you comfort when you obey him. Ooh. Instead, he will prioritize your faith every time. And when he looks at Peter and loves Peter, and because he loves Peter, he says the lesson is not done. And so the storm keeps going. Verse 31, Jesus immediately reached out and he grabbed Peter. Did I read the part where Peter had said, save me, Lord? I think. <laughs> So Peter's terrified. He looks at the wind. He starts to sink. He says, save me, Lord. Were there some gurgles in there? Was his head half above, but underneath the water? I don't know. All we know is that it says Jesus immediately rescues him. So the arm of Jesus goes out and rescues him from sinking. Not on my watch are you going to sink, right? And it's like, why is it immediate? Is it because Jesus is right there next to Peter the whole time? I kind of think so. But Jesus rescues him, and then, let's go to the next verse. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? Okay, couple things about this. 
first off, Jesus rescues him first, and then they get to the lesson. Some of us have been told that God will keep us in the dark place until we learn the lesson and get the answer right on the test. Do you see the grace of God here? I'm going to rescue you. We're going to be up level right here. Now let's talk about the lesson. Everybody's safe now. That matters. That order matters. Also, the tone in which you read this matters. Because we have a way, don't we? Where we read a story like this and we're like, man, just Jesus is so powerful, so great. He's walking on the water, you know. It's like he's super, he's super loving, super dear, and all this kind of stuff about Jesus. But when it comes to a moment like this and he says, oh, you have little faith, we immediately think that he goes stern. And all of a sudden, it's, it, it's like that angry college professor, that angry parent, that drill sergeant. And all of a sudden, Jesus is going after him. And we, get, we do this tone shift in our brains without even thinking about it. And some of us have been taught this way with the scripture. Don't let yourself do that. Watch that tone because it matters the whole thing. So when Jesus says, what does he say? He says, you have so little faith. The Greek there is little faith. He doesn't say, you have so little faith. He doesn't say, oh, you of little faith. That's just translators trying to make this easier on you. He actually calls him little faith, like a nickname. Like, how you doing, Mr. Little Faith? <laughs> so why can't we read it with that tone? Why can't it be loving? Why can't there be a wink in his eye? Hey, Mr. Little Faith, how you doing? We all right? And why did you doubt? And why did you doubt me? Again, the, the faith isn't in evidence. The faith's in a person, ultimately. Why did you doubt? They have a little lesson there. And it's like, I'm not ripping on you. I'm not tearing you down. Why did you doubt? I want you to think about this. Because when you got to the top of that pole and your legs started to shake, you're tempted to throw the whole thing out. And it's like, maybe there's a different way of life then every time you get afraid, you give in to the fear and you obey the fear. Come on, Peter. Let's do this different. Do you hear your, your calm, loving, gracious Lord trying to, trying to teach your brother? Because I think that's what he's doing. And then they get back in the boat. Why did you doubt me? Let's, let me say this real quick. Every time you trust God, I think a change happens in your soul. Every time you make the choice, like Peter made the choice, I think a change happens in your soul. We give in to faith or you give in to fear. A change happens in you. So when you trust God, you choose to trust God, what's at stake? You need to ask yourself this question. Why does it matter whether or not Peter succeeds here? What's at stake? What's at stake is he changes his own soul, does he not? If he chooses the Savior, he chooses to walk in faith in him, what happens? Well, the very next time, because he changes his soul there, he starts a pattern in himself. Isn't this the way that we work as human beings? The very next time, isn't he inclined to choose God again and to choose faith again? That's the first benefit that he gets, right? Every time you trust, you will trust God more now, from now on. And if you trust God... You will trust your fears less now going forward, won't you? Won't you get a little stronger? Won't you get a little better at this? Because you've learned. And then the last thing is you become a person of faith instead of a person of fear. I think that matters. See, we're eternal souls, and God is interested in changing us. And that's why this stuff matters. Because every single victory that I get and I choose to walk with Jesus in his way, and I leap off the pole, when I do that, I've changed me. Of course, I haven't done it. God's done it. The choice. The choice is important. So what did Peter get? Let's talk about what Peter got. Go back to Abraham. I, I mentioned it before. God tells Abraham to leave his home and go someplace else. And Abraham does it. Right? Abraham does this crazy, bold thing. And you see in the, in the story of Abraham that Abraham would take these bold, risky steps with God. He even negotiates with God in order to protect the land of Sodom. Do you remember that? In order to protect Lot and his family? 
Abraham took big risks with God. Moses took big risks with God in the Old Testament. Moses had done all this crazy stuff, and he's on the top of Mount Sinai. And some of you guys rem- might remember this. Moses says to God at one point, you know what? I'd like to see your glory. I'd like to see your face, God. Who asks for that? But Moses did. And God's like, listen, no living man can actually see me and live. Moses still wants it. So God says, I'm going to find this, this like sliver in this rock, and I'm going to hide you in it, Moses. And then I'm going to walk past you, and you're going to be able to just see my back as I walk by, and maybe that won't burn you to a crisp. And that's what Moses does. No one else ever saw the back of God. Moses did. Scripture says that when he came down from the mountain, his face was still glowing. The residual glow of God physically. You want to walk in miracles? Moses did. Because he wanted more of God. He asked for more of God. There's a moment where King David said, God, I want to build your temple for you. And it was an expression of David's like worship. He wanted to build God's temple. And God told him no. Said, no, you've shed too much blood in your and you're being a warrior for Israel and stuff, you can't build my temple. But God does turn around and bless David in this massive way. He says, the king, the throne, will never leave your family, David. So even the Messiah one day would be called the son of David because the line of David would never come to an end. And God made that promise right there in that moment when David said, I want to build your temple for you. There's this history, and Peter's part of this legacy of people who come and say, God, I don't want to stay in the boat. I want to come out there. Even if I fail, even if you tell me no, even if it doesn't go so great, I'd like to come out of the boat. We need this in our faith, right? Like we got to want more of God. Like, you know, you were not saved by Jesus to, to merely read Christian books, listen to Christian music, and attend church and warm a seat for the rest of your days before you die. Duh! No! He has more for you. Like, this is this is just journey. It's this adventure with God that he's got for you. He wants you to seek the Lord of glory because he's within reach of you. Peter shows us that. They're in the boat. Jesus, save us. No, it's like, I want to jump out on the water with you. Oh, gosh, we need a new kind of Christianity. We want to do stuff with God. We want to learn more about him. Start eternal life now. Yeah, let's do that. So what did Peter get, even though he seemed to fail the test? He got an experience with Jesus, did he not? Who else got an experience with Jesus? He got an adventure and he got a lesson in faith. I would love to have been Peter. I would have loved that, to have gotten everything. Like Jesus calls him little faith. Hey, Mr. Little Faith. How many disciples were still in the boat? What do he call them? If he's little faith, right? You want to be on this side? Uh uh-uh. uh. They don't get a name. Love those guys, whatever, but, you know, like I'd, I'd rather be Mr. Little Faith with some potential and some room to grow. Verse 32, when they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped. Then the disciples worshiped Jesus. You really are the son of God, they exclaimed. So Jesus did calm the storm. The disciples saw all that power. But here's what I would submit to you. The 11 disciples who were still in the boat, they got information and they got theology. They did not get experience. They did not walk it the way Peter got to walk it. So imagine this. Imagine, because Peter got changed as a result of this. Do you think... Peter took greater risks in the future, right? Jesus proved to him, I'm safe to take risks with, right? Even if you start to sink, I'll reach out and grab you every time. Changed Peter. What kind of person did it make Peter? So I, I got to thinking, I'm like, what if, what if we could have the apostle Peter here today in church? Like, what if he was the guest speaker today? 
what would I ask him to preach on? What would I ask him to teach us? You're like, well, you ought to let Peter decide, probably, because he's the apostle stinking Peter. And you'd be right. <laughs> but if I got to choose what he would come up here and tell us, here is what I would choose. Isaiah 43, 22. I would hand him this verse and say, Peter, would you teach us this? Isaiah 43, 22 says, when you pass through the waters, I, God, will be with you. And through the rivers, when you pass through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. And when you walk through fire, you shall not be burned. And the flames shall not consume you. Do you see what God's promising here? You will live as a human being in a world surrounded with water. And you were designed to sink. Because you're dense. But I'll never let you drown. <laughs> And who knew the reality of that better than Peter? I will never let you drown, ever. What in this life is trying to drown you right now? What's up to your... And I'm not sure how much longer. What's trying to bury you? What's trying to end you? And you've gotten so close to that point, you've just... You've not been sure about the next day. I knew a young couple and they were having their very first baby. So excited, so cute. And the baby was stillborn. And I preached that funeral with them. And they went through a serious dark night of the soul. And will we ever have a family again? And will we ever get over this? And will we ever be able to move forward? And do you see the waters coming up on them? See, that's a level of pain many of us can't imagine. And the beauty for me is, is not that they went through pain. The beauty for me is that I got to see Jesus reach out a hand to them and keep them from sinking. And they've got two, two kiddos today, and I see their Instagram posts, and I rejoice with them every single time they post another cute pic, okay? Because I've got history with them, and I've seen what God's done with them. I've known people who, they had an unfaithful spouse who betrayed them. And they had to walk out of a difficult, terrible situation. And they wondered if they would ever love again. And they wondered if they would ever trust another person again. You see the water coming up. How am I going to make it through? I've seen people go through bankruptcy. I've seen people lose jobs. I've seen everybody's financial world completely fall apart. And the water starts to rise. And this is the real stuff, Christians. And when we're sinking in this life, do we believe in the same Jesus that a Peter believes in who will never, ever let you sink? Like, I've been there, and I know, and he's pulled me up a thousand times. Can you say that? Say that to your kids. Addictions. I've known people with addictions drowning them, destroying their life, one category of their life, section of their life at a time, relentless addictions. And you try to get ahead of it. You get beaten down again. You fall back in and you binge again. And you start to lose hope. Is this the life stuff? This is all of it. What would Peter say to you? Peter would say, you're human and you're dense and you're going to sink. But Jesus will never let you sink. And Jesus, he doesn't swim. Come on, somebody, that was good. Jesus doesn't swim. I don't think the imagery is an accident. Jesus isn't subjected to it. Jesus isn't down in it like that. Jesus steps on it. That's his level of daily victory. And he wants to bring that to you. Amen? Would you guys stand right now? say he won't let me sink 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 ever Isaiah tells us that Peter felt it that's what you're trusting in today amen that's what we're trusting in
Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you, Jesus, for the, the way your character and your personality just jumps off the page at us, Lord. You are so strong, God, but you're also so loving. I thank you for the individual care you gave to Peter. I thank you for the, for the journey and the adventure that he was able to go on with you. And God, we want that kind of an adventure today. And God, we just declare to you in, in, the, in, the, in the quietness of our own heart that the waters of this life have been rising and we have been struggling. Stress and crisis, pain. And God, when our legs start to shake, Lord, and we start to doubt, we start to wonder, I pray that we would pray that prayer, save me, Jesus, save me, Jesus. I pray for that kind of walk of faith for all of us across this room, everybody that's online. We love you, Jesus, in Christ's name, amen.